the repeal report? So when we have this is S211. Yes. Other recommendations. Yep. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with uh, the Office of Legislative Council here to do a couple of walkthroughs this morning. As Senator Sears was saying, you're starting with S211, which is an act relating to Department of Corrections Authority and Responsibility for Furloughees and for Housing Young Offenders. It's sort of a long title there because there's actually two different discrete issues going on in this bill, but they were both DOC related, so they're together at least uh, as far as uh, introducing the language goes. So I'll, I'll talk about each one of them separately. They're fairly straightforward. Uh, the first one you'll see on page one, absconding from furlough warrant. This should remind you of what you looked at last year and, and where this c comes from. You re recall that uh, the issue was, and it was part of the whole attempt to uh, reduce uh, people in prison beds, and it had to do with the fact that uh, people who were absconding or going away from furlough for a short period, period of time were being charged with felony escape and being imprisoned for sentenced to much longer sentences when the underlying facts of the situation suggested that it really wasn't an intentional permanent escape from DOC custody. It was you know, not being uh, available for a day or two. Maybe they were off at a family member's house, something like that. And I remember uh, Commissioner Touchette uh, brought that to the committee's attention and the committee passed language that made some exemptions for those furlough situations and said in those situations the person will not be charged with uh, felony escape but would be subject to internal discipline at, at DOC. So that was, that's not what you have in front of you. That was one statute. He also passed this one in conjunction with that because the issue then was, well, if the person's not committing a crime, how do we get the person back to the facility? How do we get them back to DOC? And what you passed was some language which you see lines 15 through 18 on page one, the non-underlined language. That's, that was passed last year. And that gave the uh, commissioner the authority to issue a warrant um, to have the person brought back to DOC custody. So well, this language um, uh, was brought to the committee and, uh, from DOC when evidently an issue has come up, which is that some law enforcement officers are declining to enforce the warrant. And um, I think that work? because that's, I think the, you'd have to find out from the DOC exactly what the circumstances are behind that. My understanding of it was that there was some question on the part of the LEOs because they were issued by the commissioner rather than a court. And so they weren't sure about the validity of that. And this is for people who have really absconded, not those people. Not ones who actually have committed a felony escape and have gone away to Oklahoma or something and are planning on not coming back. Yes, this is only for the, the, the you see line 17 lists the, yeah. the particular types of furlough that this applies to. So uh, can I ask a question here? Because this has come up. I've um, been talking with Vince about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no. In what yes. capacity have been talking to Vince? <laughs> Well, um, what happens is one of the, uh, and I don't, I suppose it's the same, a standard condition of furlough or probation or parole is that you not leave the state. Hmm. I believe that's true. Furlough, you cannot leave the state. Right, okay. So, because you're technically still incarcerated. Right. So, where I live and where he lives, it's closer to go to across the river to go fishing on the New Hampshire side than to go to Bennington or Otter Creek. And where he lives, there's nothing up there on the Vermont side. So people regularly go over to New Hampshire to, to do what, buy their cigarettes or whatever it is. And so that it seems to me that that's a ridiculous um, condition. I think it That's has to do, the Department of Corrections can correct me, I think it has to do with interstate compacts. And you can't send your prisoner to, they're still technically prisoners because they're on furlough, and you can't send your prisoners to Massachusetts without Massachusetts permission. And Massachusetts can't send their prisoners to Vermont without Vermont's permission. And I think that's what the problem is. We ran into this on, 
people who needed uh, medically assisted treatment in Bennington, methadone, and they are either in Greenfield, Mass., or North Adams. Right. And there was no way for the Fur Louise to get to North Adams without a special, uh, a transport I don't know what, or something, yeah. something had special to had to be arranged yeah. by the corrections department in order to allow them to go out of state to get that treatment. I think that, and I could be wrong about this, and that, but, but well, I think I, that's what it is. I, 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 I don't know, but it's I that, just, he we said will, that. We will be, yeah, that's a good, I plan to use this for the, um, the things that Mike Smith talked about the other day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, the sex with inmates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you, no. that, this yeah, is a vehicle go in for here. that. This would be the vehicle. Okay. So All right. we could, we'll definitely have corrections in to talk about this. And if I'm wrong, that's fine. Um, but I believe that's why. Because I know that they basically said, no, you can't go out of state for the treatment. <clears throat> and uh, Medicaid is actually providing the transportation in a special bus. Mm -hmm. So that's how they got away with it, I guess. Plus, Plus we're, we're, yeah. we're but Medicaid's paying for it's worth an hour to have a conversation and look at that compact. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if we change the furlough system in justice reinvestment, and I, that one of the proposals I think is going to be to have very few furloughs and go with a presumptive parole type of system, that would end that problem. But it wouldn't for the parolees because that's still a standard the parolees can go of theirs. Out. No, they can't. I don't think they can go outside of to do it. parolees. Can they can't, go outside? They're not supposed to go outside of state without permission from their I parole. Think might, there's a, I think the compact takes. Yeah, I, don't, I think they can't go out of the country, but out of state, I think they can go off. Okay, I don't, I don't know, but we were just talking about okay. that about some of the issues in corrections, and we're looking at the workforce. I just wondered what capacity Vince was in. Oh, no, he wasn't. I don't think he was in any capacity. Oh. <laughs> and he said they don't really enforce it up there for people going out of state because it's the only place well, they can go to get something. He is the law. Officer. Right, right. So He is the chief law enforcement officer in the county. <clears throat> and, and the chief prosecutor and the chief defense attorney. And yeah, I believe he's working with the, for the defender general up there. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, it just is one of the issues Senator that I Senator Richard seen. Sears. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. I, I just. It's chapstick. Thank you. Uh, got it. Got it. Yeah, I got it all over too. All right, Eric. You, know. you didn't expect oh, that. Was silly. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> The, uh, I said all the, all the, the proposal does in that section, as I mentioned, that there's evidently some problem with the enforcement of the warrant. It provides language that just says a law enforcement officer who is provided with a warrant uh, has to execute it and return the person to DOC. So that's the proposal. So I, I know it's being a dead horse, maybe, but so we passed legislation saying Commissioner of Corrections can issue a warrant. Correct. And they're saying, we don't think that's good enough. So now we're going back and saying that they shall do it. But isn't, in other words, this, <laughs> it's hard for me to interpret what we did last time as allowing any ability to say no. And I understand that this is now a stronger way of saying no right. to do it. Right. But, but it seems like these people are fine with just ignoring what we did last time, so. Maybe we should hear from law enforcement about why I they guess. feel if they haven't been trained, no, if they don't know the law, or, yeah. We You're in charge of training. Yes, that is true. I mean, I, I'm happy to vote I'm gonna, for this I'm and gonna make it the new doubly clear, but it <laughs> seems yeah. like a failure to communicate more than that. <laughs> so. It's just like, it's the police, the police are the problem, say I'm not accepting a warrant from a correctional officer, he doesn't have authority. I haven't heard their perspective Isn't on that it, so, what it so I only like know what the, We should maybe what hear the, from them. The, yeah. Sounds the like much to do about nothing, but we're corrected. But if not, well, so let's ask, ask yeah, somebody who's refused. Commissioner Schilling, what the issue is, or Matt Birmingham. 
Vince wants the things to do with guns and probation officers? No, it's a huh? I don't think so. No, that's okay. I think about uh, so uh, the department is also Department of Corrections also proposed uh, what you see in Section Two, uh, and Section Three is related, and that's more of a technical piece. But but the substance of it is in Section Two, and this has to do with <coughs> current law you see in lines seven, uh, sorry, eight through thirteen, and that basically it has to do with housing young offenders, right? How how young offenders have to be separated from adult offenders. And the way the language currently reads, it's that, uh, you see line 11 there, appropriate separate facilities have to be provided for offenders under age 25. So that's the age cutoff now. If you're under 25, it has to be a separate facility. Is that currently no. being done, though? No. No. Yeah. no. A separate no. facility no, or a separate the... unit in the, could it be in the same they, facility? We passed this law, they all mm -hmm. agreed to it, and it reminded me of the law that we passed regarding um, uh, what's that word? People who are incapacitated by their alcohol problem. Inebriate, Public inebriates. Public inebriates. Right. And we never, you know, we keep delaying it and delaying it. And their problem was that they were unable to establish separate facilities yeah. to house offenders under 25. So this would allow them to keep them separate within the facility, I think. Separate, but in the same facility. So but sight and sound, it's called, or something separate. Well, the sight and sound is for those that's under 18. Yeah. Sight and sound is under 18, under 18 because that's, I believe, federal rape elimination law. Yeah, I think that's right, and that's under 18. So if you're under 8, and I know Rutland has four beds, I think. Mm -hmm. Rutland Correctional Facility has a number of beds that are eligible for that population who's under 18 <clears throat> need to be sep in a separate uh, by sight and sound. Do, do you know how many they use? What does that mean? I know they have one person at yeah. age 16 right now. Or, you know, when I say right now, now within the last whatever the, you know, whenever day I ask the question. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, whatever day you ask is different. Yeah. yeah. Dick, what? just clarification. Sight and sound, does that mean it's allowed for them to be able to see and hear each other or not? No. no. Separate. Be separated. separated by sight and sound. From the other population, from the old population. So, so it... They can't be able to see or hear each other. They eat separately. They yeah. Okay. So you see, the proposal here is to change the age threshold for separate facilities to under 18s. So if you look at, and for the under 25 year old population, or that would then become say age 18 to 24, it becomes it's just it's appropriate facility. So um, sort of a different age range in which the separate facilities have to be maintained. That's Why the we now that? mixed up now. We were talking about 18 to 25 year olds having different, and here we're lowering it to 18 instead of 25. Yeah, I thought, almost begs the provision number 1A ought to be just struck all together. If you're going in that direction, I'm not suggesting that you should, but what's this <laughs> right now? Yeah. yeah. But I thought that we're going in the other direction. I thought we're, we're moving backwards here. No, go to section three. Well, we're, we're, we're reducing the number of people that you have to provide. The, part of the youthful offender law that we passed <laughs> a few years ago, or the Juvenile Services Act, we, uh, we, we passed, you know, we changed the age to 19 and then right. 18 and then 19. We also required a separate facility for those under 25. Right. That's where the problem came in for the Department of Corrections because we've been talking about their their churn is so high that for them to provide yeah. like Newport as a separate facility for those under 25 became extremely difficult. So I think what they're asking for here, and we'll have testimony from them, mm -hmm. is the ability to separate, you know, for example, you may have five units that are people under 25 and five units that are people and they'll just be in separate units. But this but doesn't say that. I understand that, but that's why we need to have that discussion. Um, 
this was language that came from the department that right. yeah. Eric had, and frankly, the department's in somewhat turmoil in, in terms of, as you know, commissioners. Mm -hmm. This language came from Commissioner Tuchet. And he and I and Eric sat down and drafted this. And <clears throat> so I said, okay, we'll put in your language and let's talk about, I had always intended to talk about, because I believe strongly that we should be keeping people under 25 separate from mm -hmm. those over 25. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if, it, if, if because of facilities or whatever, Joe probably is, his institutions committee knows as much about these the facilities as anyone. It's just practically impossible. So, but, the, but section three increases the age. Or decreases, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> Yes, it's sort of it's a it's a technical issue, but as Senator Sears was saying, this is to true this up with the uh, juvenile law changes that this committee passed a couple of years ago, which are being phased in over time. So you see, Section Three is amending the same section of law as Section Two, right? Twenty eight VSA eleven oh one, but it's it's assuming, um, and in fact, there's there's a typo here that the whole thing is Section Two is probably not necessary because it turned, the idea is that as of July 1st of this year, actually, 2020, 18-year-olds, uh, cases against 18-year-olds have to start the family division. So it's gone up by one year. To, and then in 2022, 19-year-olds have to start the family division. And that's the change that the legislature has made, right? But um, as I thought about it just this morning, actually, so the original idea was that to true this up, we were going to, as Senator Schiff was saying, raise that 18-year-old age period that you is being proposed by the department on page two, uh, raise it up to a 19-year-old threshold to be consistent with the new juvenile law. But it turns out this new juvenile law actually goes in the, the first phase of it, the 18-year-old phase, goes into effect this year. So you don't really need that subsection C in the effective date thing. You just uh, you really should probably just if this is going to be effective this year, change the 18 yeah. to 19 in the underlying statute in, in on page two, right? Yeah. Um, that would make it consistent. Are you suggesting we amend the bill? Yes. <laughs> for, my, for technical reasons. <laughs> um, I thought it was perfect. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> um, and, in my, and I don't know if you want it or not, but uh, maybe you just cross that bridge when you come to it. But well, since the, it, the whole idea here is to make sure that we treat 18 and 19 year olds consistently with the law as it changes. Right. That's that simple. That for our purposes, they should be separate once they're. And, and then it gets further convoluted by the closure of Woodside. Right. So, if, if, you know, it's looking down the road, but what you could do then uh, is have that section three over on page three, line seven, change that age 19 to age 20. Yep. And make that effective 2022, because yep. that's when the, the age goes up even one more year, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I was looking. That's what led me to this. I looked up. This is Act 201, right. the juvenile one, and the effective dates are. Eight, right. Eight. All teenagers effectively will, except those that commit a, that are charged with a Big 12, that's will right. be under the Commissioner of the Department of Social mm -hmm. Rehabilitation. Uh, excuse me. Yes, yeah. the families. Right. And the 18 year olds go in July 1st, 2020, and the 19 year olds July 1st, 2022. Right. So, um, so if you wanted to, you could. You could. Yeah, well, we trust you. Okay, <laughs> thanks. You I, I didn't get it the first time. So, <laughs> oh, I have, uh, well, I want to, this has nothing to do with this. So, okay. I just was. That's all right. Okay. Speaking of dates, when I, I just changed this to 2022, and yeah. it reminded me, our um, <clears throat> the person that does our security at where I work sent us all a warning and said, you know how when you're writing a date and if it's 12-13-2019, uh, you write it 12-13-19? Yeah. If it's going to be this year, you should not write 12-13-20 because yeah. the potential for fraud on that is 
If it's 20, it could be changed to 2021. You could very simply add 2021, 2019. So you make a, a, a an agreement with somebody that you're going to pay them $50 a month starting in January of 2020, and you just write 20 there. They change it and put 19. You now owe them for all those. So he said you. You've got to be really, really vigilant of always writing 2020 instead of just writing 20, which I didn't. I wrote two checks one day before he said that, and I thought afterwards, wow. I mean, they were they were just checks to the yeah, sure. grocery store, but Thank yeah. Thank you for that advice. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's extremely helpful. It'll be on TV tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah. PSA. 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 <laughs> but anyway, so I thought it was important PSA. and I never thought of it. I, I never thought of it. it. I never think of it either. Yeah. However. You, you don't think people are constantly out to defraud you, but they are. But they are. <laughs> they are all the time. Yeah. Well, you have to assume that. Yeah. So anyway, I'm I just, assuming that yesterday's demonstrator frankly ran out of things to say. They didn't expect to have that much time right. no. and that was part of the problem. They just went back to the top. <laughs> they went back to what they planned and uh, that's why it continued to be the same things over and over. So you're saying these things and it's the same thing over and over. We go through these bills year after year after year trying to change the level of can I, can, can I tell you something about that dem that protest yesterday yes. with our pages? Yes. So one of the pages was in our room um, afterwards, and we were looking at the picture of the white sign that was being held up, and we were trying to figure out what it meant, and we asked her if she knew what it meant, and she said she had no idea. So we assigned her to find out. So she and two other pages figured out what it meant. They came in testified to us in our committee and gave us a history of where it came from what and what it, it he was holding it sideways oh. he was supposed to be holding it this way so it's a circle representing the earth and then there's an hourglass in there oh, okay. time is running out but he was holding it sideways so, so it looked like the know. infinity symbol. yeah so but then we asked them what they thought of the protest and they were amazing they said the, the kids were brave to come and do it. Their points were well taken. What they had to say was right on, but their execution was bad. And they said what they should have done is they should have gone through it once. They should have said, thank you for listening to us. Now we'll listen to you and sat down. That's our 13-year-old pages. That's awesome. Good. Yeah, great lessons for the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but they, they were Those right. They were brave yeah. kids to come and do it, and they had a good message. But in those two and I think back to the, uh, yeah. you know, the uh, they're looking work at center or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, they, they shot themselves so, exactly. so much in the foot. They were talking and about the like you say, if these guys have been afraid a little If you noticed that when that happened, you stayed behind the governor, and you started shaking hands with everybody the governor was shaking hands with. But you were doing your job of staying behind the governor. Maza and others <laughs> accompanying the governor were already out the door, and then they had to stand there waiting for the governor to finish. You didn't expect hand. Joe to uh, willingly leave we, the spotlight. We, we, we uh, look at the two guys up top. <coughs> the conversation we really about, wanted to know about. I don't know about, about for Ruth and Ash, but I know Sears and uh, Sears and McDonald were talking back about back. you yeah. doing your job and. Uh, Maza not doing his job. So, I, well, I got to towards the end, and Maza's at the out in the foyer, and he's going, "Yeah, where, where are they? Like, what the hell am I going to do? Push him out the door?" I, so, I, I went to the chief justice, and I said, "You know, the previous one was a bouncer. Should I pick him up and carry him?" Out? So you guys, if you were sitting on the other side, you didn't see that during the protests. I got up and walked up to the podium. I did not see that. You did not see that. Well, you, were on the other side. you did see that. And, and what did? I did was we were having this little conversation here about should we should we just leave? And so I just went up and asked the governor, do you want us to leave? Because I thought that it was his call. And he said, no, I'm going to um, just call a recess if they don't stop. So I went and sat back down, and he called a recess. And all these House members are saying, good for you going up and telling you to call a recess. 
Jim has had enough. I have such power. <laughs> yeah. All right, if we can move queen. on to, uh, <laughs> if you don't mind I'm moving sorry. on, can we move on? Yes, I'm sorry. Before I say something about <laughs> this whole thing on camera. So, where <laughs> some people Poor David Zuckerman. You remember <laughs> during the, the when we went around the state, um, Senator White and Senator Nicker, I don't, and Senator Benning remembered, we went around the state on the marijuana issues. Why David Zuckerman joined us at one of those meetings in Chittenden County and, and other places. And immediately people started saying they didn't want that Zuckerman bill, the, oh, yes. <laughs> the corporate weed bill. Yeah. <laughs> I felt the same way yesterday. Zuckerman put in the on, awkward position of oh, yeah. having the police clear the audience. Well, and that guy yelled out, <laughs> yeah. who was on the other side yeah. from the from the rest of them, and he said, "You're complicit." When David said, "Oh, I didn't it's hear It's time that. to, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean sometimes he, when you're in power, to his best interests, right? He yeah. just ends up because he had introduced the bill before we did our yeah. bill, and, uh, the corporate weed bill. Remember that? Yeah. 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 Call for a people's assembly. Yeah. You demand the people's assembly, and I'm thinking, you're, you're here. The governor's letting you um, have your say in the people's house. Like, what? I don't know yeah. What, yeah. what you're envisioning beyond that. Well, you're right. The worker center did the same thing. Yeah. When they now, this is about things. people consuming alcohol. Wait, this no. is not. Wait, where are we? Where this is S234 now. Well, which is the miscellaneous S211. bill. This is not the cell phone bill that everybody's here for. Uh, is this still 211? No. I heard no, there's a right. cell phone right bill to prohibit. The pages are all up in arms about it. <laughs> well, yeah. Senator Rogers, and it's in this committee, and I have not decided whether to take it up or not. <laughs> Senator Rogers <laughs> will introduce a bill, and if we do, <laughs> introduce a bill that would ban <clears throat> cell phones to persons under 21. If we're going to ban guns for them, he says we should ban their cell phones. Well, that's his motivation. Huh? Well, and also I think the tobacco age. And Oh, always. Oh, trying to make a broader I see. point. He, he's trying to make his point. Okay. He said, he said right. that he wasn't sure if he'd vote for the bill anyway. <laughs> so I spoke to him yesterday, told him I was surprised it was in the Judiciary Committee, and would he like me to take it up, and he kind of giggled. Somebody must have put him up. I've already been hearing from mothers in my neck of the woods who think it's a serious thing because their kids are connected to those mothers by their phones. Mm -hmm. So I refer them to the MAJR, Mothers Against John Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not the cell phone. No, this is not that one. That's a different bill. Yeah. It is in this committee. Those of you who get calls about it and say, I'm going to urge the chair to take it up, or I'm going to urge the chair to not take it up, depending upon your position. <laughs> Oh my God, that's pretty. Well, it would decrease electricity consumption. But we could <laughs> we could vote it out zero five negatively and force a vote on the floor. Why? <laughs> well, no. So I'm anyway. confused. Don't do this. So go ahead, Eric. If you yeah, want to walk yeah, us through yeah. the miscellaneous, <clears throat> this is the annual miscellaneous bill, folks. That's Correct. All this is. It's okay. not a, I wondered why they were here filming it. <laughs> There's a number of different provisions in here. As you say, Senator Sears, this has been done for several years now, yep. right? The miscellaneous bill. Yep. Um, a number of other committees do it in the General Assembly as well. There's an annual miscellaneous education, tax, motor vehicle, uh, to cover technical corrections. some technical, some, some uh, substantive, but very minor, maybe not necessarily uh, taking up a whole bill. Uh, the first one I'm going to pass out, actually, this one has to deal with uh, minors in possession of alcohol, what you often call PMB. The PMB statute, and, and there are two statutes on the books. This is an attempt that has been suggested by. I'm glad to see David here. It was proposed by the Attorney General's office to clear up an ambiguity, um, because there are two statutes in place currently um, that address this uh, exact issue. So I'm just going to pass these on. It's going to be useful to look at this statute and the one uh, that's in the bill simultaneously, so you can see exactly uh, what the ambiguity is that this is trying to address. <coughs> I see. Some so other let's clarify here. which statute. Uh, exactly. Alice, who's that? 
charts that can be over there. A few of those there. So you'll see that you have uh, in the bill in front of you to look at that first, section one. You have a provision addressing miners, miners in possession, PMB, uh, for persons under 21 years of age, right? That's what it says, line 12. And it's a civil violation, right? That's what happens. The person will go to diversion. If they uh, don't complete diversion, they get referred, uh, they get a civil penalty. At the same time, if you now look at, that's a civil violation, as I said, if you look at the piece of paper that I just passed around, that's another statute that you have on the books. This is for persons uh, under age 16 who are uh, in possession of malt beverages. And, and remember, the idea you passed this in 2013, the idea of the under 16 is that they are charged with a delinquency. They're not given a civil violation. But if you think about it, if someone's 15, they are both under 16 and under 21, oh. right? So which cat, who, who does the, how does a 15 year old get charged? Now, my yeah. understanding is, now you probably get more testimony from the witnesses, but my understanding is there's been some confusion about that. And this, oh, right, yeah. right. Okay. So the idea is to clear that up and make clear that it's the group that's 16 to 16 to 20, I guess it would be, yeah. right? Under age 21, the 16 to 20 year olds. One group then under 16 is another Exactly, right. exactly. Okay. So. Um, that makes sense. <laughs> you're under 16, you're also under 21. Yes, you fall under both categories. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. So that's what's going on in that first section. So that, that there's no need to make a change to the statute I passed around because that says under 16. That remains the way it is. To clarify the civil violation. That only applies to the older group. All right. Uh, almost a similar situation. Um, actually, before we even look back again at section one, because remember the PMB on, on page one. The possession of all beverage statute not only applies to possession, you'll see lines 17 through 18 there, it also applies to basically your fake ID situation, right? Not only the PN, not only they're possessing alcohol or or they falsely represent their age for the purpose of procure, procuring alcohol, alcohol. Sorry. So you give a fake ID in order to get alcohol. However, that person, again, this is a civil violation eligible for diversion, right? That same offense, if you look at section two now, could be charged. Uh, under Title 23, the motor vehicle statute, under uh, the counterfeit license provision statute. So if you look at that language, lines 9 to 10, a person shall not display or cause to be displayed, uh, have in their possession any fictitious or fraudulently altered operator's license. So if you think about a minor using a fake ID to try and buy alcohol, that would be the same thing. They would be possessing a, f a fake license, right? They could be charged under this statute. The issue is that under this statute, they're not eligible for diversion. This is a this is a motor vehicle offense. It goes down to the traffic court, mm -hmm. and um, the intent of the legislature, I think, which was that those PMB type offenses can go to diversion, um, wouldn't uh, wouldn't be available if someone were charged under this motor vehicle statute instead. So what this does, it says, and uh, you go to the very bottom of page three. It says, well, look, if a person can be charged with both of these things. If it could be charged with either using a fake ID to buy alcohol or this fraudulent, fraudulently altered operator's license, then they have to be charged under the fake ID statute. That way, it's got to go to diversion. Make sense? Oh. However, just so you know, there is one, there's one typo there. Line 21, that, re that or 18 BSA 4230B does not need to be there. That's a reference to the uh, minors in possession of marijuana statute. Um, but that actually doesn't have a fake ID provision, so it's not relevant. So that well, can just get stripped. You can't use a fake ID to buy something. Correct. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that might change, though. I know. We might have to put it back in at some point in time. Interesting that mere possession, though, without any attempt to use it, is actually a violation. Yeah. Of the license, or? No, the fake one. Line, uh, no, the fake one. Nine yes, that's right. Yeah. Having it in their possession, they never. I mean, I can envision a kid playing around on their computer and they <coughs> draft something to say, "Gee, why would I look like on a license?" And that's uh -huh. an automatic violation. Well, how about you have a license that says you're Elvis Presley? You know, you have, there are those ones you can get at, you know, places like versus house. You can get all these kind of different. Places. Graceland, you can buy a lot, an Elvis license well, for yourself. You know you how would somebody know you possessed it if you didn't try to use it? Well, you're showing what? it to your friends at school, and the principal yeah. says, What are you doing there? That's a, oh, my no, brother. they do. They get them from China. They email, they get them, they get them uh -huh. sent from China. 
But, but usually the intent of that is to use it in yeah. some yeah. fashion, fraudulently. This well, is really possession of it. My brother got arrested in New York State, this is 100 years ago, when he was in high school, and he he's later became an architect, but he's very artistic. And he was making New York State fake IDs for all of his friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of them got was in a traffic stop, and he pulled out the fake ID, showed it to the police officer. The police officer said, okay, it's fine. You know, yeah, you're fine. Doesn't realize it's a fake. The kid goes to put it back in his wallet, and the officer sees the other one. <laughs> <laughs> the real one. And oops, my brother got arrested. A big deal in my family, believe me. <laughs> the police came to the school and said, you know, who could do this? Because the kid wouldn't tell him who made it. Like, this was a Catholic school with Franciscan <laughs> brothers. The Mitka family. <laughs> no, the Watterson family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do not carry both licenses. Do not carry both. <laughs> One may be very good. It's going to be a heck of a show to watch. <laughs> <laughs> it always is. <laughs> this this, this may be the comedy hour. <laughs> Orca. Orca comedy hour. Uh, anyway, go right ahead, Eric. Yes. Moving right forward here. Moving along, yes. We're now uh, moving to section three, page four. This actually is, a, as you see, an incorrect cross-reference that was brought to my attention by Judge Tomasi. And he sent me an email uh, during the interim. He noted that there's a, you see on line seven to eight there, and I know how that happened. Uh, probably recall this year, or our last year rather, the big probate rewrite. Um, a similar thing happened to the mortgage laws back in 2011, a complete rewrite of the mortgage foreclosure statute, and it was all recodified. So this cross-reference to the mortgage uh, foreclosure statute just wasn't caught at that time. And so 4531, the, the statute that's struck on line seven has been repealed, it doesn't exist anymore. So you really don't want to have a cross-reference to a non-existent statute. So uh, it's updated to Chapter 172, which is now where the mortgage foreclosure provisions are. Are you okay with that one? All right, the next one uh, was brought to my attention, uh, page four. Section four, this has to do with the oath that's administered to attorneys. Who, uh, they take an oath when they're sworn in uh, to practice law. This was brought to my attention by the Vermont Bar Association. Uh, and they noticed that there's an outdated uh, gender reference. You see in line 16 that the oath that a person has to take when they're sworn in refers to that they will delay no man, and so the idea is to change that person and just update the gender neutrality. So, Joe, mm -hmm. you actually swore only to not delay men. Mm -hmm. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> So we're now going to be a requirement added to this. No all attorneys have to retake their own. <laughs> That's right. Or we could make this. We should make it retroactive. I guess we could try that. <laughs> no, I think we should make them retake it. Yeah. <laughs> they should. They could at the Just bar association con convention or something. They could do it on mass, like we do. Um, is the Next last week? is the last line of that statute now technically correct as well? I noticed that too. I, I I'm not sure. So help you God. Mm -hmm. Well, we do that in, don't we do that we, when we? Offer, you, you can take the offer. Oh, you offer, yeah. Yeah. You can take the offer in. Yeah. We don't. We don't, so. that's right. We don't. Well, didn't Zuckerman, when he uh, took his oath, didn't he? He may have said it. Yeah, I think you're right. He changed the wording to uh, affirm. Yeah. You were playing around with the miscellaneous stuff. You might want to just. <laughs> I know. It might be worth asking um, <coughs> Judge Gerson or somebody next time you happen to, or I can ask him too. Oh. Do, they, do they say that now when they when they venture the oath over there? If I we take know. it out, though, our president will probably be down on Vermont. More, more down on Vermont. <laughs> more down on Vermont. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's, uh, We're being a heathenistic state. That's where we well, uh, slip in a provision. Let me say this about that. <laughs> Yes, we can take a, a look at that. Yeah. Whether or not that should be struck. Or yep. Yeah. You have to put something else in, right? Moving right along to testing for infectious <laughs> disease. <laughs> yes. This is a proposal. It's sort of like a little different. Yes. Each uh, each section is very different from 
sort of a, ver a hodgepodge in some ways. Um, but it's, uh, this one has been proposed by uh, James Pepper and the Department of State's attorneys. The current law, you see, sort of the most important piece of current law is over on page five, that first paragraph, lines one to six. And what that basically says is that under, under the existing procedure, a victim of a sex crime can obtain a court order uh, for, to get the offender tested for sexually transmitted diseases after conviction. Somebody get that? After, that's that's yeah. the gist of it. After conviction, the victim can get a court order to get the offender tested for STDs. The proposal is, uh, for HIV in particular, that the victim, uh, if the evidence of guilt is great, that's on line eight, that's taken from the bail statute, can get the order for testing after charging. So before conviction, after arraignment, or after the charges are made. And they will, they'll, they'll testify about this in more detail, so I don't want to misstate it, but I think, generally speaking, it has to do with some federal grant money availability. Do you keep with you just make sure that we work with Peggy to make sure that they're here the next time we take this up? Yes, I mentioned it to Peggy yesterday, but he couldn't make it. Yeah. Eric, I'm not happy about that provision, but if you're going to advance it, the word hours needs to be at 48. Yes, thank you. Yep, yeah, nice catch. Um, so, it says a sexual act. No. Is that the entire gamut from, you know, kissing to? Yeah, or I'm thinking of uh, uh, groping, groping. Oh. Um, you know, in a public place or something. Right. The answer to that is no. Uh, it defines sexual act. Uh, we can look at it if you want. It's, if you remember the. Um, the sexual assault statute, there's a provision that includes a definition that has to do with a very explicit description of touching of the penis and the vagina, that sort of thing. And there's yeah. a list of several specific, and, and it generally involves penetration, okay. uh, although it can also be oral sex as well. Uh, well and why? This, I talked with Eric about, and I talked with uh, others about it. It's a federal requirement. You don't have to do it. The federal requirement doesn't even allow us to say if evidence is great, by right. the way. That's right. So that's actually pushing the new federal rule. Mm -hmm. So we need a discussion in here about whether we want to do it, and if we don't do it, what will be the penalty? And we need to also discuss whether the words evidence is great mm -hmm. are going to cause us to lose the grant anyway. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the... Years ago, when the Vermont legislature decided to not follow federal requirements on the Adam Walsh Act, which was the sex offender registry, and they wanted people under 16 to be on the registry, and we said no. We have continually, I believe, received a 10% reduction in federal burn grant funds over the years because we refused to do that. Um, and it's been our policy, and I know there's some other states that also made that a policy, but we can choose to not follow federal law if we so choose, but that means we will lose federal money. So, I, and I'm not fond of the idea that people who have been charged with a crime be treated as if they're guilty of the crime, but on the other hand, this is what they're... The other fact that you will hear from the group, though, is that there are very few people who actually ask for the test. Victims, very few victims actually ask for the test. Well, do they not? They maybe don't ask for it I, because I they think, think it's not available. Well, it, well, I don't know, Alice. You need to ask the witnesses mm -hmm. that. That's all I can tell you by basically mm -hmm. my discussion with that group. So when we put this together, that's why we put in the, where the offense is great. We don't even know. <coughs> the Center for Crime Victims may, or the network may end up telling us that that isn't even acceptable to the feds. Mm -hmm. It could be used in the reverse of the way the victim's advocates might <coughs> be thinking, or a victim might perpetrator has HIV and a alleged victim demands it, but the 
test comes up negative for the victim, I could see a defense attorney trying to argue that it couldn't have happened in the first place because there's no evidence. But HIV is a bad example to use because there's a there's a lag time yeah. where it's un indetectable, and so I think you would, you would want to do multiple tests to be sure. So I don't know how that plays in here. Could the court order require multiple tests? Well, it clearly says HIV. Again, it's a policy decision we have to make yeah. on whether or not we want to abide by federal requirements in order to have the, us receive these grants and their better <coughs> grants. Uh, unfortunately, are the Bennington, Wyndham, and Franklin County to replace the money that was cut by the Center for Crime Victim Services. Unfortunately, and I still maintain to this day, was done arbitrarily, capriciously. capriciously. Um, so it's replacing those grants to our districts. And maybe retaliatory, really? Well, no, I mean, that's, that's where the, you should be aware of that, Senator so White. No, 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 you said, and retaliatorially, yeah. if that's even a word. Well, anyway, that's the reason for this change. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so, if we're okay understanding what that one proposes, then the next, you actually go a couple of pages, the next changes until page eight. And the, these next two are extremely, extremely technical. I think we'll take for a moment. You see page eight, <coughs> lines 17 and 20, just moves the location of an OR. You had a, a conjunction there that was in the wrong place. Uh, similarly, on section seven, page nine, there's a missing conjunction on line 17, a missing and. So those are lists that weren't grammatically correct. That takes us to the last page, which uh, I would think if you take a look, the first time you look at it, it might look rather confusing. Like how many sections are there? I, I found it helpful, not that you will or not, if you even have a highlighter or a pen, to highlight on line one that that's where section eight is. And then on line four is where section nine begins. And then section 10 starts on line nine. <laughs> I know, it's the, the, the way that appears visually all on one page can be a little confusing. Um, so there's really, there's two different things going on here, and they, and they are section eight and section nine. Section eight has to do with, and this is another one I think that the Attorney General supports as well. Um, this has to do with changes that you made to the diversion program back in 2017 that had a sunset. Okay, they are scheduled to sunset this year, July of 2020. And, and there were a number of changes made, but I think the, two of the, the most important policy changes that were made that stand out that I think the committee will probably remember was one is a requirement that, that for certain crimes the prosecutor is required to provide the defendant with the opportunity to participate in diversion unless they state on the record why doing so would not be in the interest of justice. Do you remember that? It had always been a discretionary thing before, but you took out a list of crimes, and I think uh, um, it was the, I don't know if it was the listed crimes or the big 12 well, actually, actually qualifying crimes, it uses the qualifying crime definition from the expungement statute. Um, but for a certain group of crimes, uh, that statement has to be made on the record. So the question, the policy question for the committee is, what do you want to do about that um, that sunset? And the proposal that the bill makes is to repeal the sunset so that those provisions are, remain permanent. Sorry, I didn't mention the second main policy provision there that was in that bill in 2017, which was um, for adults with substance abuse or mental health treatment needs, um, they can participate in diversion regardless of their prior criminal record because generally speaking, the diversion is available for, I think, first and second misdemeanor offenses and nonviolent felonies. But if you have a mental health treatment need or a substance abuse treatment need, um, then diversion would be available for that group of people. And that's been going on. I think probably the idea when you passed it in 2017, since there were pretty big changes, is let's see how they work for a couple of years. Even if it has someone? I believe so. I believe so. Um, so that's the uh, decision for the committee to make. It's similar, uh, actually, no, not similar. Uh, there is a, a prior, in section nine, this has to do with the spousal maintenance guidelines uh, language that we passed last year. Remember, you made some changes actually in the miscellaneous bill last year and added retirement yeah. and uh, social security income, I think, where it could be added to a list of factors to consider when making spousal maintenance decisions. Prior to that, 
um, the guidelines had a sunset of 2021. That's been in existence for several years now. It's 2021 sunset on the guidelines. But when the uh, Social Security uh, retirement stuff was added, the subdivision was renumbered. And inadvertently, you changed the repeal. I said you, probably me, really. <laughs> the repeal was changed to the uh, Social Security stuff rather than the guidelines. So this just, you see on line seven, makes the correct cross-reference now in the repeal. So now it goes back to what you originally had and intended, which was the spousal maintenance guidelines are the ones that are uh, that sunset in 2021, not the Social Security retirement stuff. Okay. Right. You want to uh, slip in that language about prohibiting the stealing of signs from the Red Sox? Hell of language. <laughs> this is a place for it. You could if they're in Vermont. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but on the effective date, I think you should make uh, Section 1 <coughs> Section one effective on passage. Oh, right. I hate to not be able to yeah. arrest somebody we thought we had made it arrangements to be arrested or you know, have a warrant served on. I think we should do that on passage. Is this the one about the minors? The no. minors? No, the no, no. About the commissioner, the warrant from the minutes. commissioner. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I'm on the wrong bill. Right, right. That's what I'm doing. Oh, God, I'm on huh? the wrong bill. Wrong bill. Oh, wrong yeah, bill. that was... I'm good. sorry, I'm on the wrong bill. That's right. Oh, but I knew what you were talking about. That's even scarier. <coughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that. I didn't look at the effective date on that. No, I'm not sure. You put in some penalties for people who don't. Who don't argue. Yeah, you did it. That. You did it right. Oh, well, thank you. Good people. job, Brian. <laughs> <Eric. laughs> thank you. I, w I would too. Because okay. there, there must be a reason why they're. Right. But it's so, pretty clear. Thank you all very much. It's been an exciting week. If you say. Week the session, 17 to go.